for just a moment here tonight. Amen. Go ahead. Let's clap our hands. Amen. Let's praise Him for a moment on this Wednesday night. He really is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you praise. How great is our God. He's better than we deserve. He really is better than than we even deserve deserve, if that makes sense. Praise God. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I appreciate the goodness of the Lord tonight. I'm grateful for what He has done. Amen. I know we have several needs of prayer, and normally we sometimes we have prayer at the end. You know what? Why don't we gather around the front for just a moment before we get into our Bible study? If, you, if you're comfortable with it, just step out. Let's just gather and let's just pray if you have a need amen i believe that the lord can touch that if you have a need just slip up your hand and say there's a need in my family in my home or in my uh, i know of a need uh, and uh, i believe the lord is able we want to continue uh, to remember sister michelle uh, there is some good news there so we're thankful for that but we want to remember her Amen, and I know others. In Jesus' name, good to see you tonight. Praise the Lord. I believe that God cares about your need. And I believe as a church that when we gather together just for a few minutes of prayer, I'm telling you, it can be a rough Monday, Tuesday, but on a Wednesday night when we gather in the house of God, it makes a world of difference. Praise God. Why don't we just pray right now? Lord, I pray that you'd bless the sweet people that have gathered here to, to worship for Bible study. Those that are watching online, I pray for them as well. Ask you to touch them and minister to them. I plead the blood over everything that we're praying about right now. I loose the power of the Holy Ghost to minister to every physical need, those that have sicknesses, those that have family needs, those that have situations. I pray for the people, Lord, uh, uh, that are praying right now. I pray for NAYC, North American Youth Congress that's going on in our city right now. I pray, Lord, for our young people that are there. I pray that those that are gathering from all around the world, Lord, would feel the power of the Holy Ghost and that we would feel the ripple effects here in our church and in our community. I pray, Lord, that you would bless Solid Rock Church tonight, that you would minister to every family, that you would touch every heart. Bless our community, Lord, as we reach out. Bless our Peevely work. Bless our Spanish class tonight, our children's class, our young people tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would accomplish your purpose. Minister to us tonight, we pray. We love you. We worship you. We thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise in the name, above every name, the name of Jesus. Oh, let's clap our hands and thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for stepping out and coming up. God bless you. Shake a few hands as you're on your way back to your seat. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. It's good to see see you guys tonight. God richly bless you. We appreciate you being in the house of the Lord. Praise God. Good to see Sister Melissa tonight. Bless you. I want to just mention uh, a few things. We are... This, this coming Sunday, we're having Roca Ferme, 3 o'clock, our Sunday worship, and we're excited about that. The following week, first Sunday of August is our other Sunday, but also we're having an open leadership meeting. Anyone that would just like to be a better leader, you're welcome. I want to mention, uh, I know we uh, did bring our junior quizzers up Sunday and, and briefly uh, told what they did, had their trophy. We still have the trophy. We got, we're going to have to build a bigger case, a case, uh, but of course our coach, not everybody was here, Sister Teresa uh, was with our intermediate senior team uh, with, with the uh, senior quizzing, which is of course Marissa, we're partnering with uh, Stevie, the church there in Lebanon, and uh, they, they won, they, they, they won and then they lost, they, they didn't get as far as they wanted, but I'll tell you what, they did amazing, and I am so grateful for Marissa, we're proud of her. She's, I know, up at NAYC right now. But we're so grateful that they're there and that they're learning the Word of God and that uh, uh, 
Um, she's just an amazing young lady. We're grateful for them. Um, and I appreciate Sister Teresa for, uh, for overseeing this ministry and everybody that helps with that. It's just amazing. Amen. And I'm grateful. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let me read the Bible and then you can be seated. That's kind of how we do it. You ready? I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 2 and uh, beginning at verse number 5. Amen. Remember, be sure to shake Logan's hand tonight, hug him, and tell him you love him, appreciate him. We'll, we'll probably see him around here or there, but uh, tonight's his last official night. So there is a little basket out there if you want to drop a little card in there. And if you didn't get to do that this week, you can bring it. Bring it to the church. I'll get it to him. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I feel to talk to us tonight about a subject that is, it encompasses a lot, but I'm going to try to narrow it down to some thoughts I feel like the Lord gave me tonight. I want to talk to you about humility. Humility. Amen. I believe we have a handout, um, and Brother Derek's going to help me there. He'll be passing these out. You can be seated. Thank you. Brother Chad's helping as well. Thank you so much. God bless you. Everybody say humility. All right. At a business lunch in 1924, Howard Hughes Sr. stood up and then fell dead of a heart attack. That's not meant to be a joke, but it's just a sad fact. But here is the fact. He left a multi-million dollar empire that specialized in making tools. Specifically, they had a monopoly on a, it was a critical drill bit that was used in the old business. He left all of these millions to his son, Howard Hughes Jr. And over the next five decades, Howard Hughes proved himself to be possibly the worst businessman of the 20th century. And he certainly was a colossal egomaniac. Listen, after receiving his father's company, he immediately moved to Los Angeles and never stepped foot in his father's factory again, despite that it had built an amazing empire. Then he lost $8 million, $8 million trading stocks in the market. This is the 20s, folks. Leading that kind of helped lead into the Great Depression. Then he got into the movie business where he quickly lost about $2 million. Then he lost another $4 million on Chrysler stock in early 1930. Hughes then purchased the movie studio RKO and proceeded to lose $22 million and 1,500 employees when he ran that into the ground over four short years. And so, as you could probably imagine, all of the responsible adults in his life tried to warn him against some of these moves. But Howard Hughes knew everything. He was the genius who knew how to run a business. He was an egomaniac. And so he wouldn't listen to anybody. Finally, he just threw everything aside and he went into the aviation business. This was during World War II. He became a defense contractor. He started the Hughes Aircraft Company. And Howard's two contracts during World War II that were worth $40 million were massive failures. And guess who paid that $40 million? The taxpayers of the United States uh, and himself. So Howard, this is probably his worst failure. And he, when he went into the aviation, he wanted to build the biggest airplane ever. And so this was his worst failure. This plane, I think I've got a picture of it. It's called the Spruce Goose. It was one of the biggest planes ever made. It took more than five years to develop. It cost $20 million in the 40s, mind you. Guess what? It flew one time for barely a mile, only about 70 feet above water before it crashed. 
And if, as if that wasn't enough, he insisted that it set in an air-conditioned hangar in Long Beach, California at the cost of $1 million a year for 15 years. You say, Pastor, I bet you wish he was a tithe payer here at Solid Rock Church. Yes, well, he's gone now. But anyway, now, you'd like to think that after a setup like this, you're kind of on your edge of your seat waiting for that turning point when he turned it around and he came to his senses and he made good. Well, that day never came, unfortunately. In fact, he became an eccentric uh, recluse. In fact, I've got a picture here that shows him as a young man uh, on, on the left. And then one of the last known pictures of him in his declining mental health just before he died. In 1976, he was malnourished. He was hooked on codeine, surrounded by people who were bleeding, of, bleeding him of his money. And I'm not certainly trying to mock or belittle him at this with this picture I, I i wish he could have turned it around i wish he was a genius he was one of the richest men in history but in the end not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted howard hughes suffered from pride arrogance a massive ego that he would not listen to anyone. He knew it all. And so guess what? That pride, the Bible says that pride goes before destruction, haughty spirit before a fall. Pride would not allow him to admit his mistakes and change direction. It's a very sad story. Let me give you another one. Anybody remember Beanie Babies? Yeah. Yeah. We had some. We had some for our kid. I got a picture of those too. Look at there. You see that little tag on there called Ty? That stands for Ty Warner, who was the creative and marketing genius behind the Beanie Babies. And everything was going great. But at the peak of their popularity, Warner decided to discontinue selling Beanie Babies and to start selling Beanie Kids instead. Everybody told him this was a bad idea. But he, they said, look, those toys are ugly. You're making a big mistake. But he was another egomaniac, and they feared his wrath. Most employees stopped challenging him. And, you know, he would often say when somebody would try to talk sense to him, he'd say, listen, who's the billionaire here? That kind of thing. On the eve of the launch, one trusted advisor stood up to him predicting failure to this new product, Ty's response was this. I could put Ty's heart on manure and they'd buy it. Well, guess what? They didn't buy it. And that same behavior that propelled Ty Warner to massive success now propelled him right out of it. He was just too hard-headed to listen to anybody else. In fact, he just barely escaped going to jail a few years later. Let me show you another picture. Anybody remember... This car that's popping up there with those cool, cool doors. You met, oh, somebody said it. What is it? DeLorean. Exactly. Made famous by a little movie that was called Back to the Future. And, uh, but its namesake is John DeLorean. He was a brilliant designer. He was an amazing engineer. But no amount of brilliance could compensate for DeLorean's massive ego, which destroyed him. He had in his home, he had it filled with mirrors so that he could just see himself anywhere that he went. He had extensive facial surgery. It was, in fact, his ego and his instability to work with anybody else that drove him out of General Motors. He was one of their top executives at one time, but nobody could work with him. DeLorean seemed to be convinced that marketing would be all it would take to beat the biggest car company in the world, which is why he wasn't too concerned with making cars that actually worked. The, the DeLorean actually really worked only in the movies, to tell you the truth. It had a lot of issues, had a lot of problems. Did he acknowledge it? No. His ego wouldn't let him. Instead, 
he just put into motion a series of events that would end in a $60 million drug deal and his subsequent arrest. Just sharing a few stories here about folks who seemingly had it all, millionaires, but they were destroyed by ego, pride. Amen. I'm telling you, it'll destroy anybody. You can't make enough money. In fact, it almost adds to the issue because we think, boy, it's all, look at what we're doing and so forth. I know preachers that have gotten in trouble with an ego. I know good saints of God that have let pride destroy them. Ego is an unhealthy belief in your own importance. Arrogance, sometimes it's called. It's, a, it's self-centered ambition. Ego is the enemy of what you want. It repulses advantages and opportunities. It's a magnet for enemies and errors. I saw Brother uh, Neil Gwynn's dad and other grandfather. We normally see the, the one here, but the other grandfather's here. And uh, so they're, they're in the Spanish class right now, but one Spanish brother said this, my ego is not my amigo. And that is true. Amigo means friend. Your ego is not your amigo. And think about the world we're in now. I'm telling you, our culture fans the flame of ego and self-absorption more than ever. Look at our political landscape. Look at our, just look at Facebook for a few minutes. It's never been easier to puff ourselves up. And, you know, we, we and, and here's, this is actual scientific fact. When you post something and someone likes it, science has proven that we get a dopamine hit from that. And it's literally like a drug. And so, guess what? Some people overdose. <laughs> so, but that's the world we're in. We're in a very, we have very easy access to promote and to self-promote and to push ourselves in ways that actually would have been totally unacceptable years ago. But yet, in our modern culture, pride and even exaggerated self-esteem and honestly quite shameless self-promotion have almost come to be recognized as virtues the touchdown dance and, you know, the, the trash talking. And, you know, it's almost as if that means you must know how to do your job real well. But can I tell you, ego stems from pride. And as my grandson says, not good, Grandpa. It's not good. Pride is an undue confidence in and attention to one's skills and accomplishments, states, possessions, or Positions. I've already mentioned it, but Proverbs 16 and 18, pride goeth before destruction. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I mean, it's almost like you can sense that somebody's headed for trouble when they're walking in pride. Pride is so much easier to recognize in others than it is in ourselves, though, isn't it? Pride is the opposite of our subject tonight. Humility, And oftentimes I like to take a subject and to see what it is, let's look at what it isn't. And so we've been talking about pride and ego. Pride is really rebellion against God because, um, you know, it attributes to self the honor and glory that's due to God alone. Pride, and this is in your handout, uh, pride feeds our ego, but ego is actually the Latin word, for I, just the letter I, which is, of course, a noun when you're referring to yourself. I just thought that was interesting. Literally, ego being the Latin word for I. We've said it before, but it's worth saying again. Pride has I right in the middle of it. And that is so true. You know, when a person begins to begin every sentence with I or Always talking about I. Sometimes that could be a sign of just being self-absorbed. Ego is one of those strange diseases in that it makes everybody sick except the one who has it. Amen. Ego is a sense of entitlement. We feel like we deserve and we 
belong and so forth. It's almost kind of like that petulant child that's inside every person, the one that chooses getting his or her own way over anything or anyone else. It's when the notion of ourself and our world gets so inflated that it kind of distorts reality around us, the things that surround us a little bit. That's ego. And ego holds you back. Um, because, you know, I say it a lot, growth means change. And change is, uh, can be kind of terrifying. But ego comes in and soothes that fear and says, hey, listen, you're fine just the way you are. And, and if we're not careful, ego can be a salve for our insecurity and, and, and things like that. So let's just say, for example, maybe you desire to learn a subject. You find it difficult and you're, you're, you're having a little trouble with it. Immediately that ego says, ah, only losers learn that stuff anyway. You're way better than that. You don't even need it. Just forget about it. You're fine just the way you are. Or even worse, you hear the word of God and you feel conviction in your heart, and you know, man, I need to change. I need to implement some stuff in my heart, or maybe you need to stop doing some things in your life, and you feel that from the Word and the Spirit. But here comes that pride and that ego that comes along, and it says, oh, but you're so awesome the way you are. Look at yourself. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, you're not perfect, but compared to most people, you're doing better than so-and-so. Ah, besides, it's just a little problem here. You Look at all your other great qualities. Ego, ego, pride. I. <laughs> ego slowly replaces conviction with self-absorption. And it loves to tell us what we want to hear. You know, the deal is, guys, and I'm, I'm talking to myself here too. All of us are human. We're all susceptible to this. But... Um, you know, you, you just can't get better if you're already convinced that you're the best. I want to get better. And to do that, I think a, a, a balanced spirit of humility is the way to go. I don't want to be like old Mac Davis down in Nashville years ago wrote a song, Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble <laughs> when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. And I have to clean this up a little. I must be a really good man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Oh, my. Now, we don't sing that necessarily, although I just did on live stream to the whole world in the pulpit. But uh, sometimes we have that attitude deep down. We don't say it, but we kind of do. <laughs> well, humility is the opposite of ego. If ego is a sense of entitlement, and I believe it is, then humil humility it would be the opposite of a sense of entitlement, but a sense of, I really don't deserve it, but I'm so thankful that I have anything in my life. And, you know, and let me toss this out. A good leader should display a mixture of personal humility and indomitable will. And there has to be a balance. Sometimes you need to be strong. And it, someone said you got to have a balance of velvet and steel, and you got to know when to use each. I'll tell you what helps us. Um, let's take a look at Jesus. That usually helps us with about anything, right? His great example. He, and I think when you look at his life, you realize he was about serving others and, and ministering to others and giving himself literally to others. And if there's one place that entitlement should not be seen, it's in the church. Our text said that Jesus came to serve. He did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So uh, putting others should be a priority for us. And so... Uh, now, let me just share a little bit about humility, maybe a little bit of what I think it is. I think humility could be, if you had to say it in one word, I would use the word meekness. Not weakness, meekness. Let me tell you about the word meek. It's got an interesting background. 
Someone found a letter written by a Greek woman years ago who uh, her husband was serving in the army of Alexander the Great. And this wife wrote, the horse you captured is now meek and our daughter can ride him. So that word came to mean and what she meant was the horse had not been rendered weak. It had been broken. The horse was just as powerful as ever. But now that power had been harnessed. And that horse now places himself under the control of the bit and the bridle and, and the, the rider. And that's exactly what we do when we place our heart under control of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Amen. We're created new. He is our Lord and Master on the throne of our heart. Bible says that Jesus humbled himself. He became obedient to the Father, and so should we. Matthew 23 and 12, Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. I'm not talking about walking around barefoot, wheat hanging out your mouth, and, you know, overalls say, Oh, shucks, just pull me humble. I'm just a little old humble man. I mean, that may be your thing, but, that's, in a way, kind of pride the other way, kind of trying to showing how humble you are. <laughs> Go back to Mac Davis. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. <laughs> so I think there's a balance. The Scripture tells believers to, according to Colossians 3 and 12, to put on humility. So it's not something we come with. <laughs> and it says, be clothed with humility, 1 Peter 5 and 5, and to walk. With humility, Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. Let me give you a few other scriptures. According to 1 Peter 5 and 6, humility will exalt us. The Bible says, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So if you want to be exalted, you've got to humble yourself. According to Matthew 11 and 29, the Bible says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. I think humble pe people are more teachable. It's the pride and arrogant folks that don't want to be taught because they already know it all. And so humility says, teach me, I want to learn. God can't use the prideful. Psalms 51, 17 says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh Lord, thou will not despise. The humble receive grace. James 4 and 6, God resists the proud. Some versions actually say rejects the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Um, Matthew 18 uh, and 3 through 4. Unless you're converted, become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever humbleth himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So humility is a path to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Humility leads to blessing and reward. Proverbs 22 and 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Our human nature is not immune to pride and arrogance and ego. Even the disciples were not immune to a little self-promotion. They, they were kind of jockeying for position a time or two. Matthew chapter 20, the mother of James and John come to Jesus with a request. She said, in verse 21, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand, the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. And Jesus said, you know not what you ask. But then Jesus gave them and us a great lesson on humility. Listen to what he said, John 20, verse 26. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or your servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So what you've got is a countering culture, if you will, opinion. The world says that one ascends into greatness. But Jesus said, no, for the believer, you descend into greatness. Jesus didn't come to be be served, he come to serve. So for the believer, the way to go up is the way it is kind of down, if that makes sense. Not like depressed down, but in a servant position. 
Jesus was the epitome of humility. I'll reread the text because it's just such a good verse. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. We need to think of other people better than ourselves. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That's amazing. If anybody had a right to make a reputation, I'd say Jesus did. I would say he, he could have. I mean, he could have had the marquee, he could have had, but he came as a, in a, a stable in Bethlehem. He took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. I want to strive for that. I want us to strive for that. Amen. We, we want to combat the, the feeling of the world that wants to exalt and, uh, you know, uh, show how perfect that we are and hide every fault and all of that. I just want to be honest before God and be vulnerable for God and, 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 and not let pride dwell up in my heart and my spirit because I'm telling you, it'll destroy the best of us. Amen. So let me give you a few tips, if you will, uh, how to combat this thing that we all fight. We, we do, one degree or another. We're affected by it. So let me give you some tips for uh, combating pride and how to stay humble. You ready? It's in your handout. Number one, be thankful. Just be thankful. That's the opposite of being entitled. I really think the first step on the road to humility is to remember where we came from. And that means, but for the grace of God, there go I. Let me tell you, that's the key to worship. That's the key to every uh, advancement in the spirit in your life is simply to be grateful for what the Lord has done in our lives because none of us deserve it. You know what you said, what you did, who you used to be. So do I. I mean, I know who I was. Amen. Let me make that clear. Some of you I know. But I'll tell you this, thank God for his grace. There's nothing more powerful. I'm telling you, if you will be thankful, that will fight pride and ego in your life like nothing else. It's just when you, by the time you think that you've really accomplished something, that you've really done something, and we should take pride in our work. We should have a balance of, of you understand what I'm saying? But if we're not careful, that, that old enemy will exalt our thinking about ourselves and, and, uh, we got to remember, we didn't get to where we are by ourselves. That old saying, a, a turtle didn't get on a fence post by itself. It's true. And, and you didn't get to where you are by yourself. Maybe you got a great job. Well, guess what? The Lord gave you a brain to be able to learn, to be able to accomplish what you, you, you had. Maybe the Lord gave you a, a home that was stable and with love and provided and, and gave you clothes and a shelter and food so that you... You, you see what I'm saying? We all owe somebody something. We don't really deserve it. And, and we just need to keep a spirit of thanks, thanksgiving, a spirit, you know, thanksgiving. I can't believe we're here at the end of July. I'll be turning around and it'll be thanksgiving right around the corner. And, and so, but it, it, we really need that spirit of thanksgiving year round. I think thanksgiving and thankfulness is the foundation for humility. And that is true. Thankfulness is the foundation for humility. Number two, we need to see ourselves accurately. So when I say accurately, that means don't be self-deceived. We shouldn't look at ourselves lower than we should. We shouldn't put ourselves down and belittle ourselves, uh, you know, and, and have condemnation. However, we definitely should not think higher of ourselves than we should. Humility is not self-hatred, nor is it a lack of self-confidence. Amen. You know, 
you could say compared to the worst people in history, it's easy to think highly of ourselves. You could, you know, if you wanted to do that, you could say, well, you know, I'm not Adolf Hitler. I mean, you know, you could, you could, you could pick somebody. I'm not Saddam Hussein. I mean, you could pick, I almost called one of y'all, but I won't. I'm just kidding. I would just be kidding. I mean, you could say I'm not in, in comparison, but we're not supposed to compare this way. We're supposed to compare this way. And I'll tell you how you compare is the Word of God. Now, I may be looking at an electronic Bible, but it's the Bible just the same. Amen. We need to compare ourselves from the mirror of the Word of God. And when we compare ourselves to God's standard, which is perfection, guess what? You're put in your place pretty quickly. It keeps us balanced. God's grace does not make you better. It just makes you better off. You, you make yourself better because you have the potential to be better because of the grace of God. C.S. Lewis, it's been attributed to him who first said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. One of the best quotes in my mind ever is that one right there. I should have said I said it, but I didn't. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Amen. It's a balance. Number three, just stay prayed up. <laughs> just listen to this old country boy, Pentecostal pastor. Just stay prayed up. Just pray. Just incorporate prayer, consistent prayer into your life, and it will help you combat arrogance, pride, and ego, and it'll help us to stay humble. Amen. We don't, it, it, it'll combat self-deception. Amen. And uh, when you keep the fire of God on the altar. I read about a young seminary graduate that drove up in his new Cadillac. I don't know why all preachers are supposed to drive Cadillacs, but anyway, apparently that was the deal years ago. So this young man, he was a seminary graduate. He was driving up in his new Cadillac, and he walked into that church. He was self-confident. He was immaculately dressed, and he began to deliver. He stepped up to that pulpit after a fine introduction and he went to his text and he started to open his mouth to deliver that first sermon in that church and he froze and the words just wouldn't come finally he didn't know what to do he just burst into tears ended up leaving the platform and left in humiliation one old saint of God two ladies sitting on the front row one turned to the other and said well if he'd have come in like he went out, he would have gone out like he came in. That's pretty good, sis. That's pretty good. Amen. If we would cry and sacrifice and pray rather than exalt ourselves, the Lord will exalt you. I think it was Benjamin Franklin said, a whale only gets harpooned when he jumps up to spout off. Truth. Amen. <clears throat> Number four. Number four. Get out of your own head. Get out of your own head. Now, what are you talking about? Well, Plato spoke of the type of people who are guilty of feasting on their own thoughts. If you only listen to yourself, you're in trouble. Paul said to cast down imagination. You know why? Things in your ego and pride live in your head. And so it's easy for people to imagine the successful meeting in your head. Imagine the crowds that part as we pass by. Imagine that we're fearless warriors on our way to the top. It, it's, it, it, we can just see the opening credits and there's our name you know in the opening montage it's a we, you know we see a scene in a novel and it feels so good so much better than those feelings of doubt and fear and normalness and so we stay stuck inside our heads thinking of those wonderful thoughts rather than participating in the world around us and I think it's even more common now in our um, electronic world. Amen. And so we got to get out of our head. 
We've got to get into reality, if that makes sense. Let me tell you a quick story about compare two generals during the Civil War. George McClellan was one of the worst Union generals in history. Despite being at the top of his West Point class, he was tall and handsome. He was from good stock, but he never could get out of his own head. He was in love with the vision of himself at the head of the Army of the Republic. And he did have talent to prepare an army for battle. He could do that like a professional. He could order supplies. He could equip an army, all of that stuff. He could do the drills. But when it come to leading in battle where the rubber meets the road, that's where trouble arose for McClellan. McClellan was constantly thinking about himself and how wonderful he was doing and how great he was going to be. And he was constantly congratulating himself for victories not yet won and horrible defeats that he had saved his army from. But guess what? Lincoln had to eventually fire him because he never fought a battle. He was just fighting him up in his own head, lost in his thoughts, thinking of all this grand grandeur that he was going to accomplish. But he never fought a battle. Contrast that to Stonewall Jackson, a West Point uh, comrade who was actually st uh, socially awkward. He was quiet. He was humble. He was pious. He barely got into West Point. And then he barely graduated coming in at the, toward the last. I think he was right like six from the bottom in his class at West Point. But yet, on the battlefield, he was whipping everybody that he came up against and actually made McClellan look silly. And, and the difference was McClellan was a prideful man and he lived in his own head. Jackson was a humble man and he lived in reality. So we have to be careful in our world today that we don't just get lost in the dream and in the wish and in the, the thought. And also, listen, if the devil's going to fight you in your mind, he, that, that's where he fights us. I guess I should say it like this. If the devil's going to fight you, he fights you in your mind. He really does. And so sometimes you've got to get out of your mind. You know, activity kind of helps that a little bit. And, and maybe staying, you know, doing something. Even if you're, you know, uh, not active, but keep your mind active. Look into the Word of God. Read and do some things that, that you don't just sit there and look at a screen or lost in thought. Does that make any sense? I, I kind of feel like it matters in our life. Amen. All right, I hope that makes sense. Number five, this is the last one. We've talked about, I'm going to review them. Here you go. We ready? Be thankful. See ourselves accurately. Stay prayed up. Get out of your own head. Paul said like this, casting down imaginations, every high thing, bring thoughts into subjection to Christ. And then my last one here, do the work. Do the work. We can talk about ourselves or we can work on ourselves. Many valuable endeavors we undertake are difficult. It could be mastering a craft. It could be mastering ourselves. But the deal is, Talky-talky is easy, but worky-worky is what gets it done. A great theologian in Nashville wrote a song. I won't even say it. But there is something about actually doing the work. Amen. Now, you know, for a person who really struggles with ego, one of the worst things for them is to be ignored. That, that's almost like tantamount to death for, for anyone's ego, you know, is to be ignored. And, and so what we can do and sometimes do to fight that is we, you know, ooh, 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 teacher, we, we post, we, uh, you know, we talk, we express, and we think and we say big ideas. And I'm not against dreaming. I understand Disclaimer, disclaimer, there's a balance to all of this. We need to dream. We need to 
think and pray, all of those things. But, but at the same hand, sometimes we can express and post and do all of that and talk in order to soothe the ego. Because anyone can talk about himself or, who, or, or herself, but what is more rare is, is the silence, the ability to deliberately keep yourself out of a conversation and maybe survive without validation or affirmation. Someone said, silence is the respite of the mature. Amen. I think it was Abraham Lincoln said, better to keep silent and have people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and prove beyond all doubt or something like that. And it's true. Bo Jackson, some of you will know who he is. He was a famous football player at Auburn years ago. Played baseball too. Kind of became popular back in the day with commercials. Bo knows. Bo Jackson decided when he was in school that he had two things that he wanted to accomplish as an athlete at Auburn. He wanted to win the Heisman Trophy and he wanted to be taken first in the NFL draft. Guess what? He did both of those. Pretty amazing. You know who he told? He told one person, his girlfriend. That is rare in today's world. That is a rarity. Most people be telling everybody, right? I think it's better to do than to say. Because if you say and you don't do, <laughs> you ain't got nothing. You're kind of in a pickle. But if you don't say and maybe you don't make it, well, it might be a little easier. <laughs> Amen. Um, the poet Hesiod was an ancient Greek poet. He had this in mind when he said, a man's best treasure is a thrifty tongue. My point is, Talk is easier. Doing is harder. Talk depletes us. Doing builds us. Talking and doing fight for the same resources. And so ego talks, but humility just does. Amen. So think about that. Maybe just think about it next time. You know, ego will say this to you. He'll say, oh, just think about prayer. Just think. Post about prayer. Put that Jesus bumper, that fish bumper sticker on your car. That'll do it. That's, that's ego, but humility says, you know what? You need to shut the door, get off that phone, stop scrolling, and touch God in prayer. Humility. Ego says, oh, well, you know, just post that you love Jesus. But humility says, if you love Jesus, obey his word. Go to church. Love and serve others. Get your attitude right. Forgive, be kind, reach out. Ego will say, oh, you're good enough. You're good enough. But humility says, you're only good enough because of mercy and the love of God. Amen. And, and then you can treat people with respect because you know you've been forgiven. You see how that works? Amen. Oh, I want to be a person of humility. Again, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Just thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking of you. It's a balance. Amen. I think that's important. Stand with me tonight. Let me give you quickly, um, how, how do you, if I may, as I end this here, how do you identify a person? If I'm looking for a humble person, I'll give you the symptoms or the signs of a humble person or humility. Here we go. Someone that has a teachable spirit. Someone that's easier to approach. That's a sign that they have a spirit of humility. I would even say a spirit of brokenness because when the self-will has been broken to allow the spirit to live in someone, then they are, they've humbled themselves and let the Lord live in their life. I would also say authenticity or realness because humble people don't try to be something they're not. I would also say Faith, because a person of faith, that, that is showing me that, look, 
they realize that th their ability, their life comes from beyond them. They're, they need God in their life. They're not all that, and so they need all that. Amen. And I would say someone who is grateful, thankful, um, that's very, very important. We've already talked about that. I would also even say you can recognize a humble person because they forgive easily. They forgive easily. They're not keeping a list of all the stuff. And uh, you, you know why? Because they appreciate what the Lord did for them. Amen. They're not quick to judge others. They just, they're humble enough to know. I don't know the situation. God bless them. I'm praying for them. Instead of just jumping on the bandwagon and saying, well, you know, I heard, I seen, I, there's that I again. We're not to judge. Amen. Lord, help us to be humble people. Help us to have a spirit of humility. Help us to have balance in our life, we pray. I believe, Lord, that humility comes with the confidence that we have with you. Give us that balance in our heart and in our life. Help us, Lord, to be people that are open to others, that care about others, that almost have a, 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 something that attracts people to us. And that, of course, would be your spirit. There's nothing in us, Lord, that would do that. We need you. And so, therefore, we need to be humble people. I pray that you would help us and bless us today. We thank you tonight for the Bible study. We thank you, Lord, for the time together. I pray that you would bless our kids up at NAYC tonight. Pray that you would minister to each family here, every need that we'll face here over the next few days, that you would bring us back Sunday, Lord, and just have a powerful weekend here in the house of God, that you accomplish your purpose and do great things. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Shake hands, be friendly. I'll see you Sunday.